can hear myself now. So, so um, thank you for that generous introduction, Elaine. I appreciate it, and I apologies for the delays in uh, getting this up and running. Um, technical difficulties always happen. Elaine and I were going back and forth about whether we were actually even going to make it here given the weather. So we got blessed with the weather, at least just a lot of rain. But um, as she and I were talking, make sure you leave here before the snow starts because the driveway is steep. So, because um, we're supposed to get snow in the mid afternoon. So it's a pleasure being here, and I've been here for a few events, and I haven't been here for a while. Um, and um, I'm happy to talk about this topic. We've lost about 10 minutes or so, but I'm going to make sure I leave. Um, time for questions at the end, or you know, um, so uh, and I was sitting here thinking about how am I going to get through my material without the pictures because it's almost all pictures um, and not words. And that was, I was sitting there, you know, I'm an Irish, so I can talk through things, but uh, but uh, I probably would have been able to do that, but it'll be better, I hope, with the pictures um, to illustrate what's going on. Uh, and I don't have a clicker up here, so I guess do I just say next slide? Is that what I do? Okay, so next slide. Great, some of these are going to be like that. Uh, so what I'm, I'm going to talk about two things, and you saw the title for the talk, Rising Healthcare Costs in the U.S. and Why is our system the most expensive in the world, and how is that changing? So I want to start by grounding us by talking about what our healthcare system looks like in terms of costs. Um, in the U.S., and then um, some of the recent trends, uh, and then and then jump to the global comparisons because I know this is an international lecture. Um, and then um, what are we doing about that? What can we do? Um, and then um, it's a it's a challenging topic and a large topic, so we'll do the best we can. Next slide. This is a slide I often use and start almost all my classes. With, um, and it talks about, um, it shows national health expenditures in the United States um, over time from 1960 to um, projections out to 2031. And to orient yourself, the years is on the, on the x axis and the percentage of GDP is on the y axis. Um, and what that means, if you don't know what GDP is and what percentage of GDP means, Basically, think about that as our whole collective income in the, in the country and how much of that we spend on healthcare. And so, what this shows you is at the beginning, we were 1960, we spent about five cents of our income on healthcare. And we are now spending um, close to, uh, well, we, during COVID, we we're spending close to 20% or 20 cents of our income on, on healthcare. Um, and it's, it's a pretty steady increase, as you can see. Um, if you do regressions in a stats class, that would be a pretty easy line to draw a regression on. Um, and uh, I can tell you that if you went backwards in 1950, it was um, 4%. And um, so and in the first uh, initial measure that we did of this, the FDR had it also at about 4% in 1930. So, Essentially, the healthcare spending in the U.S. didn't rise very much until the 1960s and then sort of took off. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, and, and it's been a very steady rise since then. And the way I have you think about this is if we're spending money in healthcare, we're not, being, we're not able to spend it on something else. So we can't spend on travel, we can't spend on movies, we can't spend on cars, we can't spend on housing. Um, you know, a challenge that I want you to sort of get your brain thinking about this is, you know, what if I put a different title on this chart? And like I speak in the education, you know, what if the chart said U.S. education expenditures? Uh, would we be so upset about this? We go, oh, this is great. We're spending, we used to spend five cents on education, now we're spending 20. That's great. You know, we all love education. A little bit of a challenge these days, but but um, you know generally that's considered a good thing. What if we said you know um, food or travel or something like that? But there's something about healthcare. I can tell you about an economist for several years of you for people think this is a crisis or a problem. But 
But it's interesting to a health economist to go, why is this a problem? Because your spending on this is someone else's income. To the doctors, to the nurses, to the hospitals, it's someone else's income. So um, just put that in your head and think about that. We'll come back to that. Next slide. Um, so sort of putting this in words, um, again, you know, back in 1960, we spent one out of $20 in uh, healthcare in 1980 was when I was 10, basically. And by 2030, it's supposed to be about 20% of GDP. And um, the possible explanations for this that economists endlessly debate and others are, we demand more um, for healthcare in the United States. Um, and we, um, and partly because we have a very generous a health insurance system that doesn't control our um, health care spending. And we, we are probably the leader in the world in inventing new technology. And the new technology is very expensive. I would tell you that health economists think that is probably the leading explanation for why health care expenditures are high in the U.S. among another one that I'll cite in a minute. But it's our high technology. Uh, we invent truly spectacular things, but they're extraordinarily expensive. And we can do things like transplants and, you know, you have to take a pig heart and put them in a human and all this stuff, and that's very expensive. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we pay our providers a lot, um, relative to the rest of the world. Um, and, uh, and so, again, um, you know, that I have a son who's in computers. Maybe some of you worked in computers in your life. And I put this challenge up to him at one point. I said, Pierce, my son's name is Pierce. I said, you know, why is it that when I bought my first computer, it was $10,000 in 1980. And I bought my next computer, it was $10,000. But it was about twice as fast. And I bought my next computer, it was about $5,000. And it was about four times as fast. And now those phones that you have in your hand probably do as much as my first computer. And they cost about two or three hundred dollars. You buy a laptop now, you can get it for five hundred to a thousand dollars. So in a lot of places we think new technology lowers has lowers costs, right? But in healthcare, new technology increases costs. So when we invent a new technology in healthcare, it tends to be really expensive. And that's been a dilemma that health economists have been struggling with for a long period of time. My son, who's way smarter than I am, had a really interesting answer to him. And he usually does things like this. He goes, oh, Dad, it's so simple. And, uh, you know, so he, uh, and I said, well, if it's so simple, could you tell me? Because I've been trying to figure this out for years. And he goes, well, you know, um, when I want a new computer, I get a top-end computer. And those are really expensive. Those are ten to fifteen thousand dollars. And the new one comes out for ten to fifteen thousand dollars. But most people don't need a top-end computer. All they do is Word and go to the internet and they do a little bit of spreadsheet stuff. And you can do that with a five hundred dollar computer. So you can use the second or third generation computer. For that you don't need the fifteen thousand dollar computer. And it's a better healthcare if you went to the doctor and they said, we just invented this new technology, but we're gonna give you the 10-year-old technology. Would you accept that? <laughs> That's part of the problem, I think. Is if, if we invent the technology, we want to use it, even if it costs a million dollars. Um, but most people in other places, you know, they're willing, they're not willing um, to spend the extra dollars to use the new technology. So that's one big challenge I think we face. Our prices are way higher than um, they are the rest of the world. Um, and I think economists, other than the technology aspect I just cited, we would say that that's probably the thing that jumps out the most. Most other countries in the world control prices. We tend not to control prices because we believe in the free market. Um, and uh, we, we are now starting to take tiptoe into um, controlling prices for prescription drugs. 
but we've just barely tiptoed into that world. It's a very political morass. Um, but in a lot of countries in the world, they just don't have this problem of controlling prices in medical care. We tend to have, we have a real perplexing healthcare system where much of the dollars in healthcare are public. They're paid for for Medicare and Medicaid, but the system is private, and they will guard that with huge fights and lobbyists. And so, you know, the hospitals and the doctors want to get paid what they think they're worth, including millions of dollars. You know, the CEO of a managed care company gets paid $25 million, or the CEO of EJC gets paid five, seven million dollars per year. And the best doctors at WashU get paid in the millions of dollars, and and they're not going to say, you know, I, that's what I deserve. And if you don't pay me that, I'm leaving. So, um, but that doesn't tend to happen in other systems. Um, and you know, the quality of our healthcare is just has spectacularly improved. Um, with that technological improvement has come um, with quality improvement. Um, and there was a great book written by David Cutler a few years ago, which uh, if you want to read it, it's very accessible. He's an economist, but about 100 pages, you read it in a night. I did, I read it in a night. Um, and I think it's called Your Money or Your Life. And uh, he cited this example, which really stuck in my head. We had a president um, in the 1950s, Dwight Eisenhower, he had a, literally had a heart attack while he was president. And, um, and you know what they did with him? They put him on bed rest. <laughs> they put him on bed rest for several weeks, a couple months, because that's all they could do for heart attacks at that point. They said, go to bed. The president of the United States. So, um, so after that, we, we have we have bypass surgery, we have, you know, really pretty remarkable things we can do. So if the president had a heart attack today, we would not put the president to bed. You know, so, so we would probably do some major surgery on the president and get the, the person up and going within, you know, a few days. So we won't talk about what's going on with the Secretary of Defense right now. Um, and so, and, and then there's other things that are going on, aging and chronic disease. Frankly, economists don't think that's a big contributor to healthcare costs, and I can get into that later. Uh, next slide. Um, I want to sort of maybe a somewhat complicated slide, but this sort of shows what happened during the COVID period. And the way to see this is the bars of the changes in health spending. Um, and the line is what's going on with GDP. So during COVID, we had the biggest recession we've had since the Great Depression. That's why we saw a big drop in the, in the green line there. And if we had not had government assistance to the healthcare system, that we would have had the red line that's happened to the healthcare system. The first time in my entire career, we would have seen a recession in the healthcare system. But it was only because we literally poured trillions of dollars into the healthcare system, we got the blue bars. So we paid huge amounts of dollars from Washington into paying for COVID tests and COVID vaccines, basically subsidizing uh, healthcare. Literally, much of healthcare shut down. Um, dentists' offices, 80% of them were furloughed and things like that. Um, but the, the dollars were replaced by government. Next slide. Um, this is a complicated graph that sort of shows the same thing. The, um, the dashed line is what happened to GDP and the red line is what happened to healthcare spending. Next, next slide. And there's a lot of words on here, but there's other ways you can view healthcare spending. The premium you pay um, if you're employed um, is one way people look at it. And it's truly getting quite high right now for a family of 20, uh, for you know, a family of a reasonable size is $21,000. Think about that. You know, the challenge is that if you hire somebody who, you know, is a janitor or a low-income worker, that's an entire wage, you know, $20,000. You know, it's not a problem for my chancellor to pay $21,000 for his health insurance, but, 
but it is for the, the lowest wage workers. So um, administrative costs in the U.S. are very high, um, and I'll come back to that later. And um, our per capita health spending, another way to look at this, is about 12000 per person, which is a lot. And uh, next slide. And this is what shows you the growth in health premiums. Um, you know, based on uh, back in about 2000, the health premiums were about 6000 and they're now about 22000 for a family. And um, so, you know, again, that's a huge amount of money. Um, next slide. Why do we care about this? There's a whole long list of this, probably in your own head, you've heard of in the press. It creates a strain on workers and employees. I just talked about what happens for low-wage workers. We have fewer tax funds available for everything else. We're spending it all on Medicare and Medicaid. Um, we have increased health insurance costs, um, fewer salary increases. If employers are paying for health care, they're not paying for wages, and uh, so on, burden on family budget. So it's a big concern in the U.S. Now I'm going to switch to the international comparison. Next slide. And there's a lot of visuals here, but um, probably the most important thing on it is on the top. We spend more on healthcare than anywhere in the world, and we have for a long period of time. Um, we, uh, and that's been true pretty much since 1970, and. Um, and the question that we all pose when we look at this internationally is we spend more than anybody in the world. Do we have the best health care system in the world? And do we have the best health, health in the world? And that's the challenge. So next slide. Um, this is maybe one of my favorite slides, or depressing slide, and maybe illustrates almost everything we need to be talking about. And it has a lot of lines on it, so that's not important. What's important is on this axis is the rate, health expenditure adjusted to US dollars, and then on the y axis is life expectancy. So when we measure how well our healthcare system does, one of the ways we do it, imperfect, I will tell you, is how long people live. And what you see on that graph is there's one line that sticks out. It's not only because I made it bolder, <laughs> yeah. um, but it would be sticking out even if you didn't make it bolder. Um, and it's been uh, like that for a long period of time, from 1970 to, 19, to 2015, and that's why it's a line. In the U.S., um, started off spending more, and we're more in line with the rest of the world. And now we're certainly not in line with the rest of the world. We spend more than everybody else, but most of the rest of the countries have higher life expectancy than we do. And that's remarkable, alarming, frightening, and challenging. So, um, so, and you know, this isn't just a OECD European issue. It's not just a um, you know, because you can see other countries like Mexico in there, and, um, and Japan, uh, even China is really taken off. Um, there's Central American countries, and so on. So, next slide. I'm going to go back to the U.S. and just sort of mention this. Um, one of the big challenges that we faced in the U.S. in the last few years, and I can answer questions about it if you want. I'm not going to dive into it deeply is the challenge of what we're now calling the deaths of despair. And what do we mean by deaths of despair? It means a, a researcher, the Nobel laureate and economist, in economics and his wife, noticed that we started to see a drop in life expectancy in the United States in the last few years. And it was primarily due to three factors. And they ended up calling it the deaths of despair. Opioids, alcohol, and, um, and drugs and guns. So, um, and by guns was meant mostly suicide out in the rural areas and um, homicides in the urban areas. So, 
guns, drugs, and alcohol. That's the fear. That was even before COVID hit. So for years, we've been improving our mortality rates, and then lately, we've not been improving our mortality rates. Actually, in the last few years, they've been going back up again as things go up again. Yeah, maybe the battery's out here. <laughs> No, just hold it closer. Hold it closer, okay. So, um. Dog, no, I'll hold your hand higher up the microphone. Oh, hold the hand higher, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so, now back to the world. Um, next slide. And I think this slide pretty much shows the same thing the healthcare spending is percent of GDP. One of the things I wanted to show you is we used to be pretty much in line with the rest of the world in healthcare spending. And we took off in about 1970-ish. In fact, um, it's probably hard to see that, but Canada spent more than we did in 1970. But now, now we're so far ahead of everybody else. It's not, um, we're, they're not even close. So when we think about um, comparing to other healthcare systems, what would next slide? What would we want to look at? We think about access, cost. Uh, efficiency or effectiveness. This is the way healthcare people think about it. We call it the triple aim. Would healthcare systems provide good access to people at a reasonable cost and are efficient? They don't waste a lot of money or effective. And um, how are we doing on that score? Um, and I'm going to tell you that the way to think about world healthcare systems, next slide, is they tend to fall into at least mostly European countries, you know, like three different buckets in the way they handle their financing. In the, uh, some countries are like the National Health Service in Great Britain, where they basically, um, the government owns the means of the healthcare system, so they actually employ the healthcare workers. Um, so it's not like us where we have private healthcare sector and private fi financing, but or and then some public financing mixed into. We are very unique in that way. Um, but in Britain, it's almost all public funded, and it's a national health service. And a lot of critics would say, "Oh, you want us to become Britain, do you?" Well, but most countries are not like Britain. They're more like a national health insurance model. Most of European countries, Germany, France, are some variation on a theme where the um, where the Delivery of the healthcare system is not owned by the government, but the financing is entirely, almost entirely by the government. Um, so the government runs the national health insurance, pays for the healthcare, but the, the delivery system, of course, there are public delivery systems, but it's not uh, owned by the government. Um, and, um, and then I list corporate status, there's sort of variations on this theme. If you look at the history on this, Germany, going back to Bismarck in the 1800s, uh, built a social welfare system, and which was used as a model for our social security system. A lot of the people that came over in the, in the migration came, uh, were aware of the German healthcare system. Um, we're running out of time. Late. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll try to uh, go through some of this quickly. Um, so, next slide, and then I think I'll skip that um, and go to the next slide. So, Commonwealth, next slide. So, when you look at rankings of healthcare systems, Commonwealth Fund ranks healthcare systems around the world, and the US is on the left. And you can see we're not number one, we're ranked number 11. And they rank us on access to care, 11th, care process, 2, administrative efficiency, 11, equity, 11, healthcare outcomes, 11. So we're not at the top, even though we spend the most in the world. That's mostly what I'm pointing out. Next slide. Part of the indicators, there's a lot of numbers here, but you can see that our life expectancy is among the low is pretty much lower than the rest of the world by three or four years. You saw that on the other graph. Infant mortality is a really big problem in this country and rising. 
Um, and it's often used as a metric for how healthcare systems do. 5.8 is a lot higher than most of the rest of the countries. Air pollution deaths, obesity rate is rising in the US. Um, big problem. Um, and percentage of people are smokers. We do pretty well on that, um, given our fight against smoking. And um, you know, percentage of the population, population is aging. <coughs> we are um, an aging population, but we're not the oldest in the world. Probably Japan is at this point. Next uh, slide. Um, I will just point out again that our healthcare system is Byzantine and complex with a lot of administrative costs. Uh, by various measures, 13 to 15 to 20 percent. A lot of that is due to our health, health insurance system. We have a private health insurance system with over 2,000 insurers, and that creates a lot of extra paperwork, a lot of claims administration. And if you talk to any health providers, they'll complain about the administrative costs related to healthcare. And I can come back to that if you want. Um, that's most people's. Um, Take on this, uh, the Medicare system, I think it's a little bit of an understatement, but the Medicare system has administrative costs of about one to two percent. When you look at the cost of actually administrating the bills. The private healthcare system is more like in the 10 to 15 percent. We fight about this, but, but that's a lot of dollars that's not going towards healthcare. Next slide. Um, there's a lot of numbers in here, but the main thing I want you to look at is that when you're doing some of these things like claims administration, um, the people in the healthcare system have to spend a lot of time doing that administrative work. We actually look pretty good in the first column. We're actually kind of lined up with the rest of the world in the amount of time they spend with patients. But it, they spend a lot of time outside of those do, doing the claims and administrative costs. Next slide. Um, and, um, you can see the, the percent of physicians who say that um, insurance restrictions are a problem look worse on this graph. Next slide. Um, I think I'll skip that slide in the interest of time. But here, here's my point about prices. Um, the OECD average is in the middle, um, and the US is here. And there are some countries that have higher prices than us, but a lot of countries that have lower prices than us. And um, so, um, and I can come back to that as well, but our healthcare prices are quite high compared to other countries. Next slide. And we have, I can tell you when I, practically every meeting I go to these days, the big concern about our healthcare system is workforce, workforce, workforce. We don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough healthcare um, people of any sort. Coming out of COVID, um, we, there's been a big shift in the labor force, a lot of people retired, a lot of people gave up on working in healthcare because it was difficult, especially in nursing homes. We had one of the most horrific cases in the country happened to a nursing home in St. Louis, but they still haven't found one of those patients after they closed the nursing home. It's my life. Um, so um, you can see that we have fewer patient physicians per thousand um, than many of the countries in the world. Yet again, we're one of the most expensive in the world. Uh, next slide. Um, nurses, same thing. We're kind of in the middle there. There's a huge nursing shortage in the U.S. right now. And um, so. Um, I will probably not get to a lot of the rest of these slides, but I want to mention a few things because I teased in the beginning that I would talk about what we can do to, to fix this problem. I would tell you about some of the things that we are doing. So next slide. Um, countries with single period systems um, have found spending control easier um, because they tend to have a what's called a global budget. They collect the taxes for the healthcare system. They give a budget to the hospitals. They give a budget to the doctors. They control how much is given to the system. And uh, there's a lot less administrative costs. And, you know, you can, we don't tend to like this in the US because we don't like social 
systems. Um, we don't like government control, but it's just, when you look at this across the rest of the world, this is just the way it is. And, um, and, um, and they're able to control prices a lot easier um, than we do. But it's interesting in the US, um, we have a lot of price controls. And you hear the word price controls, most people, most conservatives will go, oh my God, don't do price controls. But you know which president instituted probably the biggest price controls in any sector in the US? Reagan. Hmm? Reagan, with Medicare. In 1983, passed the prospective payment system which controlled prices in the hospital. And so, um, so there's a paradox. So, um, so we have a lot of price controls within the Medicare system, and within the Medicaid system, we just don't do it much in the private healthcare system. So, um, and you know, like I've mentioned the administrative costs. Um, we have some controls on supply in a way because the spigot of entry into medical schools and nursing schools is, is probably one of the biggest problems in terms of getting them out and into the workforce. And I mentioned the global budgets already. Um, cost shifting refers to if we have a lot of uninsured, and we probably have the highest percentage in the world that we did before Obamacare, and it's going to be start rising again. The somebody pays for those costs, and that's cost that's shifted to others, including those who pay um, people of employer-sponsored insurance. Um, next slide. Um, so I'm going to skip that one because I think I already covered it. What do other countries do that's sort of right and that we can learn from? Universal coverage um, really helps and we're moving towards that. Investing in primary care, reducing in, you know, administrative burdens and investing in social services. In my school of public health, we talk a lot about you just can't think about healthcare just being about healthcare. You have to think about what we call social determinants housing, poverty, um, the, whole, the whole person, because that all contributes to health care um, costs. Um, next slide, and I wasn't going to do this, but I'll, no, I think I'll skip this. Go ahead, skip this slide. And I will say that the market is trying to reform itself in the US. We have a huge rise in managed care. We have a lot of mergers and consolidations that could go both the wrong way. Um, we have, we're not doing much in alliances anymore. We have a ton of appear organizations. And, um, I'm going backwards maybe. Sorry, some of these slides come in piece by piece. And I wanted to talk about managed care. I wanted to read, have you read this quote because this came from the editor of um, the leading journal, in, um, New England Journal of Medicine, I think that. And I, I put the capital letters there and they said, um, the quality of managed care is seriously threatened. Actually, I think the quality of healthcare is what it should say is threatened by managed care. And the answer to this is to look at quality as well as price. When I read this as an economist, I was going, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When you, you should look at quality as well as price. When you go to buy a car, you try to buy the most, the highest quality car possible, right? At the most, the, the car, at the price you can afford. I would love to have a Mercedes or a, you know, whatever expensive car, but if I can't afford it, I don't buy it. But I know what the cars are that don't break down. So um, when this editor put up here that he was shocked that we are now looking at prices as well as quality, I was like, as an economist, going, well, it's about time we look at cost. You know, yes, we should. And basically, the healthcare system got used to just saying, have the best quality in the world, regardless of cost. And just go away if you're going to start saying, look at cost. But 
you know, there was a revolution that happened in healthcare about 20 or 30 years ago where economists kind of came in and said, we can't afford to be doing this. We know you want to keep spending all the money you possibly can, but there's a limit to this because you're going to end up using all of our money in the United States. Um, so, um, so it, and that's the point I want to make. And managed care is, um, and I'll just finish with two, two quick things. If you could go to the next slide. Probably the biggest change that's happened in healthcare in the last 30 years, and I call it the industrial, you know, the insurance revolution. And this is a somewhat complicated graph, but if you go at the top, the dark blue is not managed care people. It's like Blue Cross, not managed, not HMO, that kind of thing. And by the bottom, that's almost gone. So almost everybody now is in a managed care plan. And what does a managed care plan do is it's, it comes in and second guesses what the healthcare system is doing. And says, no, you know, don't do that. It asks for a second opinion. And it comes in and it questions the cost. And we don't like that very much. Um, and there are now managed care plans in Medicare and in Medicaid. Over 50% of the people in Medicare are in a managed care plan. Over 50% of the people in Medicaid are in a managed care plan. That means an insurance company like Centene on the street is the biggest managed care company in Medicaid. And, um, and it's growing. The final thing I'll point out, and then we can go to questions, is aging. Um, and the next slide, um, I will maybe come back to that later. We are one of the lowest tax states in the world, but um, next slide, next slide. Uh, emerging trend, next slide, I'll show the graph. Um, So this shows the age and dependency ratio, and what that means is what proportion of the sum of young people plus old people as a proportion to those who are working. And you can see that that is rising um, in the United States. You know, we're on the cusp of getting close to one dependent person for every worker, meaning there's one young person and one, or one older person for every worker. And we were in a period like this at one point in the 1950s when I was a baby, um, and because we had a thing called the baby boom. Now the baby boomers are retiring. There's 70 million of them. Maybe some of you are in that group. Yeah. I am as well. So uh, we have to pay for those folks. Um, and I used to chair the Medicaid Oversight Committee in Missouri, and I made a talk about this, and I pointed out this demographic reality to the legislators, one of them was libertarian, and I pointed out this demographic point that the baby boomers are here and they're not going away unless you want to like make them go away somehow. <laughs> We're not going away. And you have to pay for them. And we pay for we pay for our health care through Medicare and Medicaid largely or retired health insurance. And it's a reality. And um, it's a challenge. So, and you can't just sort of say, well, you can, because some people are saying it, we're just going to, like, cut their health care. You could say that, um, but I don't think it would be very popular. Um, or you could just sort of, you, you can't, like, ship them off to another country, you can't kill them. Um, you know, so what are you going to do? We have to pay for the, uh, the, these older folks. We're not the only country in the world that's facing this. Other countries have faced it already, Japan and Germany. Most of the countries that lost the World War II faced this a lot sooner than we did because they lost most of their younger folks in the war. We were blessed not to have as much loss in World War II, so we, and we had a huge baby boom after World War II, and so we're now facing what Germany and Japan faced. Japan struggled mightily to get through this, and they're not done. Uh, Germany is doing a better job of it, but I can tell you the big difference, if you go back, maybe go back one slide, two slides, three slides, sorry. The big difference is they have higher tax rates. 
So if you're gonna pay for Medicare and Medicaid for older folks, you got you really only have three options. I'm an economist and I'm just telling you have three options. You can cut those programs, you can borrow the money, which we're already doing ridiculously high, we got $24 trillion. Or you can raise taxes. Those are the only options. And you know, it's math. It's just simply math. And you can say, oh, we don't raise taxes in the United States. We can't, nobody wants to do it. Oh my God, uh, sky's falling. But we have one of the lowest tax rates in the world. Now we can say we don't want to be friends, but uh, that's how they do it. That's how Germany's done it. And I can tell you, we would not have to raise Social Security taxes by more than about two percentage points to solve the Social Security problem. All the vitriol around the Social Security problem is about two percentage points. Can we afford two percentage points more on the FICA tax? I think so. This is where I get into trouble. I always do this at the, the end of every talk. And then, but Medicare's a little harder. If we were to do it by raising taxes, it would be several percentage points in taxes. So most of us who are health economists want to do it by a combination of lowering the spending as well as raising the revenue. But we're not going to get rid of the older people on Medicare and Medicaid and the disabled folks. So that's what we face. So last slide, um, and then we'll have questions. Keep going. Next slide. Next slide. Slide, sorry. There you go. So we have rising health care costs. It's a worldwide issue. The U.S. has been leading health spending since 1970. Other nations have found other ways to control this, but we have humming changes and challenges. Aging and chronic disease, I didn't talk a whole lot about that. Climate, I didn't talk about it at all. And the technology. So um, economists try not to be dismal when I give their talks, but I almost always end sort of dismally. Um, but I also just try to be honest and tell the reality of it. So anyways, we'll stop there and I'd be happy to take questions or